Okay, so we're delving into the topic of quantum mechanics. We are not given a ton of time to really get into a lot of the, the meat of this, which may be good, maybe maybe a little good, but uh, what I plan to do in the three lectures that we have on this is to give you the, the real basics of what quantum mechanics is, what it means, and just some basic problems that we can solve with this. Uh, quantum mechanics is conceptually very challenging, mathematically insane, really. It's uh, the, I'll show you uh, on Monday, but um, one of the simplest problems that you can do in quantum mechanics is to uh, um, the model of the hydrogen atom. But um, even though that's one of the simplest things you can do, the equations that arise out of that are incredibly complicated things. And treatment of other atoms with quantum mechanics is currently not possible because the mathematics is so complicated. Put it that way. <laughs> so uh, we have a complete solution to the hydrogen atom with quantum mechanics. We have approximations of other atoms just because <clears throat> the interactions between protons and electrons are, are increasingly complex the more and more you have. So in the hydrogen atom, you have a real simple interaction, one electron, one proton, simple enough. Um, but add in another proton and another electron, then everything gets extremely complicated very, very quickly. Okay, so, um, so just to be clear about what we're getting into here, quantum mechanics is, the best way to put it, is a completely different framework of thinking in physics. In, in many ways, you're, you're, you're almost taking a different class when you do this. Um, except a lot of the basic concepts you learn in physics, we think still apply. Um, but it's a completely different way to approach physics. And to give you an example of this, um, when you take Physics 110, one of the very first things you learn, aside from basic units and vectors and things like that, is how we model objects. And we have this thing called the particle model. And when you go through all of um, kinematics, when you go through all of Newton's laws, when you go all through energy, even through momentum, um, you keep the particle model. That masses are point-like, do things that particles do. They bounce off of things and they have, you know, so they have momentum transfer, they have energy, things like that. Well, <clears throat> quantum mechanics starts off with a completely different topic. They say, well, okay, things are not particles. Everything is a wave. All your particles will be treated as if they're waves. And all the things you've learned about waves in this class, interference, for, as for example, um, is something that particles could do. If two particles were to bounce into each other as a particle, they just bounce off of each other. But as a wave, they pass through each other. So that concept of shared space is, is very different for them. And one of the ways that this pops up, you can see this kind of approach to things is through um, something called the uncertainty principle that exists as part of quantum mechanics. Now, the uncertainty principle is, a rec is a, basically a recognition recognizing that waves are a completely different concepts compared to points. And we can look at an example of this from the diffraction experiments that we've seen earlier. So if we have monochromatic light, as you see here, come in contact with the slit, um, there's an intensity profile that's on a screen that has a real big um, spike in the middle, right? And then little fringes on the sides. That's what the diffraction would look like. And um, the thing that's funny about this is that we can have 
um, light consistently shining on the slit and the pattern appears. Or we can shoot single photons one at a time through the slit. And what happens is over time, the intensity pattern will start to show up. So imagine that we do this one photon at a time. Um, with one photon at a time, uh, and say the screen has the ability to, you know, detect when a, a photon hits, we can see the intensity pattern build um, over time. So here's an example of that, you know, uh, after, so this on the right hand side here is the, the patterns that we have for the uh, interference patterns. Um, this one's showing a two slip pattern here, but it works for any kind of those things. But we have 21 photons hit, and then they kind of hit at these random locations here. And after a thousand, we see a more clear pattern. After 10,000, we see a clear pattern. So this is strange because this is kind of showing the opposite thing where the waves <clears throat> are acting more like particles here in the sense that a single one hits. And this raised a very interesting question. Uh, how does a photon decide where it's going to go? Does it decide it's going to go on this fringe here? Does it decide to go on the fringe on the far left? Um, it's a very odd behavior. I mean, we sort of envisioned previously, at least from a more classical standpoint, that you have these waves that are consistent. And then there's an interference pattern because they hit at the same time and they overlap and it causes interference. But while that's true, um, it does appear to work for things that behave like particles, like photons do. So this is, this is rather strange here. Um, and so, but this is an inherent part of the quantum world where you have um, a lot of randomness, and a lot of probability. And that's the big difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics is that there is not the same kind of deterministic physics that exists in, in, particle, in, 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 in classical physics. There's an uncertainty that's inherent to it because that's the nature of waves. The waves we, waves exist over a space um, instead of a point, and so that I I enables an inherent in in uh, uncertainty. So, um, in the example here, we draw a few things up here. Let me go back a little bit. So, for like the diffraction, um, for the, the diff wait, actually, let me go back to this. Yeah, let me bring up a, a whiteboard. So for the diffraction, um, the location of the first minimum is approximately given by lambda over a, right? And so that's that's for order one. And so that's the angle that's made with a straight line that goes across. And so in your pattern here, you have a, they said you have a, like a big bump here and a smaller bump. And this angle here is formed right here, basically. And so this area up here can be described as plus lambda over A. And this angle down here is minus lambda over A. And it turns out when you do these experiments, and they actually count these, that 85% of your photons will fall on that um, on that bright fringe, 85% do. And 15% decide to go somewhere else, all right? Now, if you can see in this, go back to the slide here, the angles that are given here would essentially be the same angle when you want to describe the momentum of these photons. Because as it goes through the slip, if it's not going to hit right in the center, 
That means it does have some kind of momentum to it in the y direction, where it previously did not have that. The waves coming through did not have a y momentum going through, at least not individually necessarily. Maybe if you think about Huygens' principle and the idea of wave fronts, then yeah, that's true. And so you could also say that <clears throat> the angle here, annotate this. So you can also say that the angle here is an approximation of the y momentum to the x momentum. So if you think about the momentum vector being at an angle, it would be contained in that angle, right? 85% uh, are contained in that angle there. So the angle is also a ratio of the momentums. So if we equate the two together, let me make this a little thicker and not baby blue so we can see it, either red or something. Uh, then we have a further statement we can make, and that's that the ratio, these ratios, are equal to each other, these two angles here. And if 85% um, <clears throat> are in that first fringe there, then what we can say here is we can say PY equals px lambda over a. And uh, one minute here. I'm trying to read my notes. I don't know what I wrote here. Hold on. What did I write in my notes? Mm. Oh, yeah, the, the wavelength. Sorry, going back to the De Broglie wavelength um, can be written as uh, H over the momentum. That was actually the definition of that. So we'll make that the X momentum. And we substitute that into the bottom here, bringing this up. Um, we see that or PY would have to be sort of greater than or equal to this quantity here for it to be, you know, larger, be outside of that. So this represents, in a way, a kind of an uncertainty. So the PX is drop out here. I just get H over A. Now, A is a slit width. And so you can describe that as sort of an uncertainty in the Y direction, right? Because a certain distance that the photon can exist when it goes through the screen there. And so this turns into this idea of an uncertainty that the particles have. We don't know if they're going to hit the center fringe here. They could end up hitting some wider fringe. So let me ask you a question first before we totally delve into that. Uh, beam of photons passes through a narrow slit. Photons land on a distant screen, form a diffraction pattern. In order for a particular photon to land at the center of the diffraction pattern, it must do what? <laughs> yes, <clears throat> that's the whole point here is that um, it can pass anywhere through the slit. In fact, if you think about Huygens' principle, which is largely focused on the concept of the wave, um, you, you can sort of speak of the photons being all across the slit there because there's this constant reproduction of wavelets. So the equation that we have um, that derived of four, um, using other methods and other kind of things, I mean, the, the exercise I just did there was just kind of an illustration of how we imagine uncertainties work for something like the slit experiment. This applies to all sorts of aspects of um, of anything in quantum mechanics is that there's this inherent uncertainty to um, everything, particles, waves, all this stuff. And um, this is, there's a lot of variations of this, but this is sort of the most widely used one, the one you see here. 
that the uncertainty and extra uncertainty and the X momentum has <clears throat> is going to be greater than h bar over two. Remember, h bar is um, h over two pi. And so, uh, what we were working on earlier was very similar, except we just got an h here. We didn't get the h bar over two pi. There's other considerations you can make. The fact that the slit is not one dimensional. It's anyway things like that. So what this is saying here is that if the x position is well known, the momentum is less known, which is interesting because in the slit experiments, if you narrow the slit, you actually widen the patterns. Right? If you narrow um, the slit on whether it's um, two slit or one slit or whatever, the, the fringes widen out. <clears throat> and that's a great illustration of the uncertainty principle because you're decreasing the uncertainty in the X coordinate, say the Y coordinate, right, for the slit experiments. Because this it says X here, but this can work for Y and Z, obviously. But if you narrow the slit, then you have a greater certainty in that coordinate and, and then your uncertainty in the momentum is, is much larger. We see that from the fringes getting bigger, so that's kind of interesting. Um, you can rearrange some of the um, values here to put this in terms of time and energy. You, you just shuffle around some, some variables there and you get a similar uncertainty principle for time and energy. It's identical, it's just from a different perspective because you can just shuffle around things in here. All right, great. So now let's get into the basics of the stuff here. And uh, I'm gonna have to do a lot of writing um, for this. So I'm gonna bring up screen shares a lot. Of course, I'm recording this. So you can always go back and look at the stuff, but there's a lot of writing that has to be done for this stuff here. So. Um, the R objects in quantum mechanics are, as I said, not described by particles, they're described by things called wave functions. And a wave function, we've learned about waves earlier in the class, the wave function is um, a statement about the nature of a wave at a given space at a given time. And so because these are functions and not individual points, there's some interesting mathematics that goes along with that. Now it's a wave and there's certain principles about waves that we know are still abided by. And one of those is the wave function. Let me bring up a whiteboard here. Let's not use lavender. Let's go with red, I guess. Clear that out. Did I lose my, lost my annotations? Oh, here we go. Okay, so there is a wave function. That waves abide by. And we derived that last time. We didn't do a ton with it but it was the second partial derivative of y with x equals one over v squared uh, equals a second time partial with respect to time. And so that was an important part of wave phenomenon and it's abided by by all waves and one of the solutions that we came up with for this was uh, basically a mixture of sines and cosines Uh, the wave number was given by 2 pi over lambda. Let's see what it had. Angular frequency was 2 pi over the period. 
uh, which could also be stated as 2 pi times the oscillation frequency. And the speed was omega squared over k squared, which eventually reveals another property of waves that the product of the uh, wavelength and frequency equals the wave speed. So that was just standard waves. Now let's look at how particles might behave. So I'm going to clear this out. All right, so de Broglie has some things to say about this. He tells us that um, the momentum of a particle in terms of its wave-like properties is given as h over uh, the wavelength. In fact, the very wavelength is h over p, right? So we're going to say that's what p is. Um, let's see here. We can, let's see what I'm going to do here. Let's do, let's multiply top and bottom by 2 pi. Uh, the h over 2 pi is um, h bar. And the 2 pi over lambda is k. It's the wave number, actually. So that's what our momentum looks like. Uh, our energy looks like the following. h, f. And I'm going to do the same, a similar thing here. I'm going to divide this by 2 pi. And then I'm going to multiply by... 2 pi and f, and then this becomes h bar times omega. So h bar k, h bar omega, k and omega were similar ideas and we did ways before, and that's related to momentum and energy. Now for a free particle, when I say free particle, what I mean by that is that the energy of the particle is given by the kinetic energy only that the any potential is zero. And so that is one half m v squared, which you can rewrite in terms of momentum to be so momentum's momentum's mv. So we include another, if you want to include another factor of m up there, you can make the momentum on top squared over 2m. And then we plug in the values we had before, these values up here. The energy is h bar omega, and the momentum is h bar squared k squared over 2m. All right, now this, if we have a new wave function, in quantum mechanics here for these wave-like particles, it needs to satisfy this relationship. This relationship has to be abided by because that is just based on a, on a basic energy argument. Energy is still gonna be abided by here. So, Let's start searching for it. All right. <clears throat> uh oh. So we're going to come up with a guess. Okay. We had a guess before, and our guess before involves sines and cosines. So let's try it out again. Um, so this is going to be my wave function. Now, this is capital letter Psi here. In fact, uh, you put a little thing on top and bottom there. Um, the way I do my size is capital Psi is upright and my lowercase Psi is like lean into the Psi. It looks kind of like, uh, like that. And that uh, it looks kind of like an X, but it's a lowercase Psi. So right now capital, and the difference between the two is that the capital one 
is when you have your wave function for position and time. And the lowercase one is when you don't want to worry about time because there's plenty of things you can solve in these problems that don't care about time at all. So we will try to tackle those. And our guess is going to be this. Our guess is going to be the same guess as before. But the principles that we have to work with here are different now. We have to abide by the de Broglie wavelength. And things may look a little different as because of that. So the second partial of um, this wave function here with respect to position, that was the uh, that was the, the left hand side of the wave function we had before. And if we do that, well, taking two derivatives of cosine or a sine is going to return the same function with a negative sign, all right? And then what will come out of the inside? There are two factors of k. So I can write this as minus k squared times the wave function. And that's exactly what the two derivatives are. They return the same wave function with a negative sign and the two factors of k from each derivative. And if we were then multiply both sides of the equation by a negative h bar squared over 2m, that would then on this side make this positive, give us an h bar squared over 2m, and look at that. Right here, this stuff is part of that relationship. There's the h bar squared k squared over 2m, that's one side of the function. So what you see on the left here is the first part of our wave equation. First part of our wave equation. Now what we gotta do is we gotta work on the other side, the right side, and we need to match h bar omega. Now here's where it gets a little strange now. In order to get the k squared, we have to take two derivatives, right? The other side has just one factor of um, omega. So that pretty strongly implies that we need to take one time derivative to get a factor of omega out, not two time derivatives. And we know that we need an h bar on that side. So, so far, our function's looking sort of like this here. And we got our second partial and this side's got to look something like a c c is just some constant we know there's something because there's a constant on the other side here there's a constant on this side too and this has got to be a uh, one time derivative here So what we would do here is you actually would – now, we're not, I'm not going to go through this, this math here, but what you do is <clears throat> you take that time derivative and you get a omega that comes out of that, and then you write out what this side is. So you put in what the second derivative with respect to x is here with the wave function in there. Then you got to match up coefficients. So to be clear here, just to give you the math, how you plug in your derivatives here, and then you match up uh, the cosine and sine coefficients. And it creates a system of equations and what comes of this ultimately, and this is it's a bit of algebra, so I'm not going to walk through it right you know, here for you. Although you're, the, uh, the Young and Freeman textbook does go through the derivation of how they get C. Is that right? Um, I'm pretty sure they do. Uh, you find out that C, weirdly enough, is I 
which is the imaginary number uh, times h bar. And then the up here, the wave function, <coughs> um, in order to get this to work, uh, if you keep A, if we keep A as our reference, then B up here, B is uh, I A. So you can actually take the um, A to the front of this and you end up having a cosine plus I sine um, as your wave function. So... Now, let me go back to the slide here. That brings us to this equation right here. So this is what's called Schrodinger's equation. And um, it is the wave equation in quantum mechanics. Um, and this is in particular for a free particle, at, meaning there's no potential there's no forces that act on it, nothing like that. Um, <clears throat> the troubling thing about this is that it contains the imaginary number, I, um, and as you saw from when I mentioned a little bit earlier here, your wave functions are take this form here. It, the wave functions take a, uh, you can write it like this, I guess x of t, uh, there's just some number out front, and then we have a cosine ohm, uh, kx omega t, and then this is a plus i sine of the same thing. And that's what our wave functions look like. So it's is strange because it's difficult to have a physical interpretation of what it means to have an imaginary number as part of an equation that explains something that is supposedly real. Um, but it does, it does obey um, the basics of, uh, of the properties of waves. So now when, now here's the weird, another weird thing about this is that this is defined over space and time, but cosines and sines, right? I mean, they extend forever, right? In the X direction, Y direction. So um, this A in the front here may be, you know, more interesting. That may change the behavior of the semi, uh, it's only amplitude, but <clears throat> when we um, square this, okay? Squaring the wave function is gonna give us, um, now when you square a, a quantity that has a complex number in it, you're multiplying by complex conjugates. So if I square this, I'm multiplying this by itself, but with a minus sign instead of a plus sign here. That would be the complex conjugate of it. Anyway, this is called the probability distribution function. This tells us the probability of where the particle might be over a given space. So what you typically do with that function is you square it and you integrate it over some space. That could be it could be infinite. You could integrate if over an infinite space. Um, you, know, you can integrate over a finite space if you think your particle exists in a finite space or something like that. And um, that is what largely will determine what A is. Because, for example, if you were to integrate, say, this function here over um, negative infinity to infinity, uh, we know what the probability has to be. The answer to that integral is gotta be one. It has to be one, right? Because the particle is somewhere. At some, it has to be located somewhere. So integrating <clears throat> the probability distribution function over all space will result in a value of one, which a lot of times is how you figure out what A is, that constant. It's, what, it's called a normalization constant. And it ensures that a particle will exist in the area that we suppose it exists, whether it's all space or whether it's in a finite area because of its energy or something like that. Okay. Now, um, there's a little trick we can do here. I'll just <clears throat> right at the bottom. A little trick we can do here. 
Um, this is called Euler's formula. And Euler's formula looks like this, e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. And the theta uh, that we're talking about here, if we're talking about this quantum mechanic stuff, is kx minus omega t. And so you might have seen this relationship before. If you've ever seen this uh, e, what was it, e to the i pi equals negative 1. If you've ever seen that, people write that thing down. It comes from Euler's formula. And um, a complex sum of these trig functions here can be rewritten as an exponential. So uh, we're going to find that it's a lot easier to do our mathematics with the exponential functions. So as a result of that, um, our wave function is now going to look like what you see down here, where that capital psi is going to be a e to the i kx minus omega t, which is nice because you can separate the kx and the omega t. And so we have a e to the i kx times e to the minus i omega t. And those are sine and functions um, as well. So uh, you're going to see the Euler representation a lot, a lot more. Okay. All right. So our first example here, um, what we want to prove is you want to prove superposition. So, and we did this, of course, back in back back in standard wave stuff as well. If our particles can be described with these exponential functions, we should be able to add two wave functions together. It show that it is still satisfied. And so let's see if they do. Let's look here. <clears throat> All right. So here I'm going to zoom in a bit so we can see this. So the, the equation we're attempting to satisfy is the Schrodinger equation, which I've stated right here on the right-hand side. <clears throat> in order to show it satisfies, what you have to do is this. you got to take the... You got to take two partial derivatives of this wave function with respect to x. So you're just taking two derivatives, assuming that x is your variable and your time is, your, is a constant here. <clears throat> and then multiply that by minus h bar squared over 2m. On the right side, you want to take one time derivative and multiply by i uh, to the, uh, sorry, i times h bar. And if the two sides equal, then it does satisfy. So the left side I have right here, I take the two partial deriv derivatives with respect to x. It's going to bring down two factors of i, k. So i, k, 1 here, i, k, 2. Um, if we square that, we get a minus, comes out of it, and the k's that are there. <clears throat> if I do the right side, the one time derivative brings out one factor of minus i omega. So then I take that left side, I multiply it by minus h bar over 2m. And so I get this right here. And on the right side, I multiply by i um, h bar. So I'll get an i squared which will give us a negative one, which will cancel the negative that's already here, and we get h bar omegas. And we can match up the two terms, right? The first term, the h bar squared k squared over 2m, matches up with the h bar omega w. Those coefficients are equal. For the second one, the coefficients are equal as well. That's the condition, the energy condition that has to be satisfied. So we can say that the superposition principle is still still works in quantum mechanics okay you can combine as many waves as you like you can do a whole bunch of waves if you like three four five tons and tons and tons so you can stack a bunch of these together to create as if there's a single wave function that represents your particle or something so that's neat <clears throat> so <clears throat> because of this 
we can do um, what I'll call wave packets, where our wave functions can actually be quite complicated. They don't have to be a single exponential. They can actually be a sum of many, 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 many exponentials. In fact, a lot of wave functions and a lot of the issues that we do <clears throat> have that sort of uh, behavior to it where, you know, the reality of particles is that they exist over some delta x space, right? I mean, that's what the uncertainty principle tells us. I mean, particles don't actually exist over all space. So what the wave functions that are going to describe our particles for us are probably going to be really complicated things in order for them to be what we call localized. So that their delta x is a certain probability of a delta x there. And so, um, do I have a slide for that? Let me just see here. Well, not exactly. So, um, for a function that looks like these here, having real and imaginary components, now these would be the, a superposition of a large number of waves. And it would have something that would look like this. In fact, the way we generally represent something like that, it would have this appearance to it here. So you'd have your capital psi here, and that's actually going to be equal to an integral of some function here of wave numbers. And then the rest of it is times our standard e to the i kx minus omega t dk. This seems strange here, but the, the e to the i kx minus omega t is your basic you know, skeleton of the wave function, and the a sub k is a function of wave numbers. So you have a huge series of different kinds of amplitudes that give us this superposition here. And if we add up all of those, that gives us the idea of the single wave function, which we call this wave packet. It would have appearances look like this. When we square those, we get these nice uh, appearances to uh, the probability function. I mean, that, that's a bell curve there. That's a very well-defined probability function. Now, you, clearly, the particle has a peak where it can exist and a delta x over where uh, there's a probability it could be exist. So there's a more probable place in the middle. And, uh, and so that will... Now, we'll never actually see these wave pack formulas here we're going to keep things simple and just do really easy to work with ones. The original Schrodinger equation that we saw was for a free particle, no potential, no forces that act on the particle. And um, obviously that's not incredibly interesting that no interactions happen with the particle. So we do have to start looking at situations where there is an interaction that will take place. And... What we saw before was that the um, the left-hand side of Schrodinger's equation was a statement basically of kinetic energy. And the right-hand side is a statement of overall energy. And so when we add potential to that, that is the total mechanical energy of that particle. So... What we do here is if we do have a potential energy function that is that particle is bound by, then we could add that term in here. Because again, the first term is kinetic energy. This represents potential energy, and over here represents the total energy. So if you make the zero, you get the free particle equation. So we can work with this equation now if we actually have something going on. Now <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> uh, we can separate out from the wave function the uh, time component. Um, and the way we do that is, I mean, we had our wave function was written as a e to the i k x e to the minus i omega t. 
Well, if the energy is given by h bar omega, then this e to the i omega t can be written as uh, e to the i e t over h bar. Now, what this means is, is that that portion of the wave function is dictated by the energy of the particle. And um, if the particle has like a, a definite energy to it, say it moves at a constant speed or something like that, then you could separate the time portion of that function that can be taken out. And what you say is that the first part, the E, sorry, the A, E to the I, K, X, is this lowercase i that is the time independent part of the wave function. And in fact, if you go uh, through Schrodinger's equation, <clears throat> sorry, um, yeah, the, the one dimensional one here, um, if you put this function in, uh, in place of the wave function, the e to the i e t uh, um, over h bar, uh, that term drops out of each, that factor, I should say, drops out of each one of the terms here. Okay, it does, it's not included at all in the derivative for the x function. Right here, it's not included in the derivative for the x function. Um, we don't do anything with it here. We do one derivative on this side, but the derivative uh, of that's going to return the same function with some stuff in the front. The stuff in the front is going to be I squared minus, I should say, minus I squared uh, H bar omega. Well, the minus one and the I squared become positive, and then you have H bar omega, which is just the energy state <clears throat> of the function there. So if we take out the time portion of it, this thing simplifies to this equation, where we don't have the time derivative over here. That simplifies down into just the energy state. And really all we have to work with here is just a second derivative of position here. So when time is not important, we call this a stationary state. And the Schrodinger one-dimensional equation breaks down to something like this, which is much nicer to work with because you can just move the energy function to the other side. You can make it E minus U and, um, and the left side and side is going to stay the same like that. All right. So <clears throat> now let me think here. I'm going to make sure I'm on track. Okay. Do that, do that, do that. Okay. So what we could show here is This function is a valid solution to the time-independent wave equation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we're still, we're going to have a free particle here. We're not worried about potential. And we're taking the time aspect out of it. And in fact, if you look at what this is, um, it's e to the positive ikx, e to the minus ikx, um, this has the exact same form as uh, standard wave patterns. It's ex it's, so this is actually a standard wave. So that would be a particle traveling, say, back and forth, just like a string uh, wave on a string traveling back and forth. So this is a standard wave pattern for a uh, for a free particle, and we'll see if this one satisfies. So we'll go to the example here. <clears throat> All right, so to, to do that, we just got to take the um, derivative with respect to x twice and see that the coefficient matches the energy. So if I do that here, I'll get two factors of i and k by taking the two derivatives. Okay. And um, there shouldn't be a negative sign right there. That should be plus. I'm not sure why there's a negative there. Let me, let me change that here. That's a plus right there. It doesn't matter because you're squaring this ultimately, but I'm not sure why I had that there. And uh, here, I think I mixed it up here. There's supposed to be a negative here, though. 
is strange. I don't know what I did here. This is pl positive as well. There's a negative in here, though. I don't know what's going on here. <clears throat> this right here should be a... This should be plus minus i k squared. Yeah, and that gives you a plus. Okay, let's show this is. I gotta rewrite this. It looks like. Um. So, the negatives that we get here. Um. From the i squared here, and then. Wait a minute. Something's not right here. Hold on, give me a second. Something's not right. Let's just let's just do this over then. Let's bring up a different screen share. Alright, do that. New share. Whiteboard. Give her all this junk here. Alright, so <clears throat> uh two derivatives of this is going to give us now the original function is move this out of the way a I think I call it a1 e to the i k I think I just called it yeah select that get rid of all that start over So this is going to be positive i k x plus a. I, don't, I didn't have an a one here; it was just a's. E to the minus i k. All right. I just double check that was the right function. <clears throat> there is an a one, a two. Okay. So there's an a two here. All right, so the two derivatives is going to be two factors. The first part is going to be two factors of i and k, a1, and then we're also going to get two factors of this, and so simplifying that, gets us a minus right minus one K squared and we get plus there's no, uh, so they're both yeah they're both like this then. and then we want to multiply by um, h bar squared over 2m, which is the left-hand side of Schroeder's equation, and if we do that, we get a positive h bar squared k squared over 2m, a1 to the i k x. Same thing here. And uh, the first parts here, this is, those are the energies, right? Because that's equal to h bar omega. So that satisfies the right side of the equation because the right side is just the wave functions times the energy. And the energies are the individual coefficients. So that does work out as a valid solution. So I... The math looks a little funny here because I guess I made a couple errors. <clears throat> I'm going to rewrite that. Uh, but the energy does match, and so that is a valid solution. So we will consider that, actually, as one of our first examples here. Uh, so let's solve the first example that we can do in this stuff. And, um, and that is what's called the particle in a box. One-dimensional particle in the box so as you saw, the um, free particle example is not very interesting. It's just here's the wave function and there's nothing, nothing really much to it. 
the particle in a box is this. <clears throat> Say we have a particle of mass m moving with some velocity v, okay? So it has a, a definite energy state to it, right? So it's a stationary state. Um, and when we say particle in a box, that means we're defining the space that the particle could exist in. Between zero and L, we'll say, the part, the um, potential energy function is zero. So in here, the potential energy, oops, Oh, so it's right here. Okay, so in here, the potential energy function zero on the inside, and then outside of zero and outside of L, the potential energy function is infinite, which means the particle cannot cross the boundary here. It would be impossible. It would have to have an infinite amount of energy to cross the boundary here. So very simple problem where we just say in the middle here, potential energy is zero. On the sides, it's infinite. So this particle will basically just bounce back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And um, the fact is that on a classical standpoint, the particle could bounce back and forth with any speed it wants to, right? Classically, it can just bounce back and forth with one meter per second, two meters per second, three meters per second, 3.1 meters per second, 3.11 meters per, whatever. Um, but, <clears throat> In quantum mechanics, it's a little more complicated. We have discrete stationary states that can exist. So let's analyze this problem here using the Schrodinger equation. That's what we're going to do. So this is a lot of writing here, so let me go through it real slow. All right, so we clear all this out. So what we like to guess, we're going to have to make some guesses here. That's unfortunately part of some of the stuff we do here is we have to just say, well, let's try something. So what's the most basic stationary state function we can have? And that would be a e to the i kx. That's the simplest wave function that you can have that, that is time independent, right? That's it. So does this work? So, in order to work, um, it must obey what we call boundary conditions. And that means at x equals zero, and x equals L, the wave function has got to be zero because the particle could only exist in that space there. So, uh, and the wave function at L must be zero as well. Okay, now the reality of it though is that if we were to plug in zero, what do we get here? We get we get a. And that looks a little funny to erase that. Select delete all that. Let's go back. And uh, at L, this is A E the I K L. And the only way that this works is if A is zero. But that's not very interesting because it means your wave function is zero. It means you have nothing. And, and that's not that's not really gonna cut it. So next is what about If we have a superposition of them. So that thing we just worked on, 
a1 e to the i kx plus a2 e to the minus i kx. Now this makes a little more sense because like I said, this is like a stand and wave pattern. This is actually describing something moving to the right and to the left, right? Because the difference in the negative sign here, right, that corresponds, that can correspond to the particle moving in a different direction, right? Different speed. So, in order to do this though, we're gonna have to write this out in terms of its sines and cosines though. Because to do the math here, it's not gonna be clear how to do that with exponentials. So that's going to be a1 cosine kx plus i sine kx plus a2. This is going to be cosine minus kx plus i sine minus kx. That's the angle here. That's using the Euler's function. Now, uh, with the negative signs in here, again, you'd have to go, you have to dig way back in your memory to the concept of even and odd functions. But having a negative in there for cosine, cosine is an even function, so this comes out as just positive. And having the negative here, uh, signs and odd functions, so the negative comes out to the front. And we've got this. Now again, this makes sense because look, the first part is a cosine plus sign and this one's a cosine minus sign. Again, that's the same thing we get from um, standard wave pattern stuff. And so now we can rearrange coefficients here. And let me bring up a new picture here. We can rearrange coefficients now, and our wave function is now going to look like this. A1 plus A2, and that has the cosine part of it. And then we have plus I A1 minus A2, and we have sine here. Okay, so now boundary conditions. Because these uh, coefficients are a little more interesting now. Um, x equals zero. If x is zero, the sine function goes away, right? Cosine becomes one, and we get here that a1 plus a2 has got to be zero. Okay, so again, if you plug in zero to x here, the sine function goes away, it's zero. You plug in zero to the cosine function, it's one. So that's x equals zero. So that means here, if this is going to work, a1 is minus a2. Hmm. All right, well, that's, that's what we got so far. So that means our wave function now looks like the following here. That first cosine term is gone. Bam, out of there. And if we stack this stuff here, let's write this in terms of A1, I guess. Yeah, so if we write in terms of A1, A2 is minus A1. That just becomes 2I A1 sine Kx. Well, that's what we got to work with now. Now the other boundary condition is X equals L. So that means that 2i a1 k, oops, not k, gotta have a sign in there. Let's get rid of that. Sign. A L equals zero. So we need that function to be zero, which fortunately is okay for us because the sine function is zero. 
in a lot of places. In fact, this is true. Well, it's true under two circumstances. A1 can be zero, but then again, that means everything is zero. That's not interesting. Or the KL is a multiple of pi, all right? Because the sine function zero at multiples of pi. And so we can solve for the wave number here. n pi over L, and um, the wavelength, remember, is given by 2 pi over, the, over k, and so the wavelength becomes, if I plug in k here, the pi's drop out, and I get 2 L over n. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that this wave function works for certain wavelengths. Okay, because when we say the sine function zero here, we're saying that's true if KL is some multiple of pi. Well, that's stating what the wave number needs to be, which is also stating what the wavelength needs to be. So this function works if for only certain wavelengths though. And the interpretation of this is this is the standard wave pattern stuff. If you go back and remember the things we did about waves when it came to sound, when it came to, you know, a string on a rope, we could oscillate that, right, with certain frequencies and only certain frequencies worked because there's a certain number of nodes and anti-nodes you can have uh, in the standard wave pattern. Well, having a statement of these different wavelengths here is this is an equivalent thing this works for certain wavelengths which means certain momentums which means certain speeds that's what we're talking about here now let me just make sure i'm on track with my stuff okay i am so let's keep going with this um clear this out okay now if our wavelength, I'm going to now label this lambda n, is 2L over n, then there are quantized momentums, h over lambda n, that's the de Broglie wavelength, and this is going to be h n over 2L. So h n over 2L is our quantized momentum, and then we look at the energy, which is given by Pn squared over 2m. And we got to square all the stuff here. H squared, N squared. Uh, 2 squared is 4 times the other 2 is an 8. We get an M and we get an L squared. And then I'm going to rewrite this in terms of h-bar because h-bar shows up so much. So this could be h-bar squared. Um, we're going to have to put a pi squared here then. <coughs> Let me erase that. It looks a little better. So h-bar squared, pi squared n squared. We use two factors for the h bar, so this is, leaves us with a 2m l squared. So either one of these work fine, just depending on what <coughs> value of h you want to work with here. <coughs> Our wave function can be rewritten like this now, 2i a1 sine n pi x over L. The n pi over L <clears throat> is the wave number. All right, so this is our almost complete solution. So our wave function that describes a particle in the box is this function at the bottom here. Um, it only works for certain values of n. 
because that's the only way that the sine function can end up being zero, both at zero and at L. So this ensures <clears throat> that when the particle is in this box, there is some whole number of antinodes, basically, to its wave-like patterns. And it's the only way that it can fit in that box that quantizes the wavelength, the momentum, and the energy, which really quantizes everything about it, right? Now, we have one thing that we're not finished with yet. <clears throat> one thing. And the one thing that we need to still work on is this first part here, 2iA1. What is A1? <clears throat> well, one of the conditions, and I mentioned this really early on in this lecture here, is that um, you have to make sure that this function is normalized. And what that means is that when you integrate this wave function over all space, that the probability distribution equals one. So you take the wave function here, we will need to square it, integrate it over all space, and that has to equal one. So when we do this, this will allow us to solve for whatever A1 is. In fact, we're not even gonna call this A1. Let's just make this, our life a little bit easier here. I'm gonna turn this into C times sine N pi X over L. So I'm gonna lump the two I A1 all together into a constant I'll call C. So we will need to normalize this function in order to make sure that we have a probability that is one, because that's a statement saying that somewhere in the box, right? Somewhere in the box, the particle has to exist. That's what the statement is saying. So let me clear this out. <clears throat> and so here's what it's gonna look like. Now we don't actually have to integrate um, the whole, the function from zero to infinity because our boundary condition, right? Normalization is what I'm gonna do it. So we only need to do is integrate from zero uh, to, um, to L here. Okay, so zero to L. And we're gonna square the wave function, so it's gonna be c squared sine squared um, n pi x l. We have to satisfy this. Okay, so let's work that out. <clears throat> um, we're gonna use, in order to do this, we're gonna use a trig identity um, that trig identity is the sine squared. Yeah, it's to be written it with a, with a half angle function right here. I can't read what I wrote. One half, one. Minus cosine two theta. Is that right? We just think about that a little more. Yeah, I believe that's right. Okay. So if we do that, we're gonna look. <clears throat> we're gonna sub that in. We're gonna get a c squared over two because there's gonna be a one half here. Um, and then zero to l. Um, oops. Come on. 
1 minus cosine 2n pi x over r dx equals 1. All right, <clears throat> so this now turns into, once we actually do the integral, the first part just becomes an x. The next part becomes a sine. And then we divide by whatever the coefficient of the x is there. That's why we get the L 2 pi, 2 uh, n pi in the bottom there. And we're evaluating this from 0 to L. So uh, now if I put in 0, that all goes to 0. Okay, so the 0 limit, everything's 0. So I really got to just put in the L limit here. Uh, L minus L2. Now the sine here though, the sine, the L's drop out here, and the sine function is 2 pi n, well that's the multiple of pi, right? So that whole second term is just zero, and that means this whole thing ends up just turning into the following here. It turns into a C, let that wrong, turn this into uh, a C squared, um, L over two equals one, right? Oh, I messed up over here. These are not L's, these are twos. Okay, so this is a two here. That's a two here. Okay, so, and that means that C has a value of radical two over L. And that is the, now that's our normalization constant. So that means if that sits in the front of the wave function, instead of the 2iA1, we instead put a radical 2 over L. Um, when that function's integrated from 0 to L, we'll end up with a value of 1. So it's normalized, uh, meaning that um, the probability works out to be 1 inside the box. Okay. I think that's, that's finally it. So... Let's go back over to the slide and see. So this is our, this is the energy up here that we derived. And the bottom here is uh, what the wave function looks like uh, where L is the width of the box there. So this is about the simplest example that we could really do here. Um, just have a a region where the potential is zero. So it's not a completely free particle. It's a free particle, you could say, inside that box. The potential energy is infinite outside of it. And the prediction here is, is that in that state, the particle cannot exist with any speed it wants to, any wavelength it wants to. It's sort of subject to certain wavelengths and speeds that are dictated by its wave function. So you can kind of see, you can get a little bit as to why this quantized nature stuff exists. The particle has to exist in this stationary state where it's a standard wave pattern, which is kind of how we talked about our Bohr model, how the electron when it's in the orbit has to be in, basically that's considered to be, you know, like a particle in a box thing where the electron in the orbit is has a certain number of um, stationary states to it that corresponds to standard wave patterns. So, all right. Now, the nature of this energy function here is this goes up as n squared. So this whole, all this stuff on the right here, the pi, that's a constant, the h bar is a constant, the two, obviously is a constant. Now the ml, m is just the mass, l is the length of the box. So that's obviously that's a, that's a function of how that's set up. But here's how our wave functions look like. If I have different values for n here, they have these different energy states. There's the ground state which is just e, E1. 
And you can see here, you have a single anti-node right here. We've got nodes on each side. Um, for two, three, four, or five, you can see the number of peaks increase. So you have a higher energy. Um, the wavelength starts to drop here. The energies go up by factors of n squared, which is what we saw for hydrogen atom as well, too. So, <clears throat> but again, it's a, the particles in the box here. The wave functions are how we describe in the particle. Now you can evaluate at a certain moment in time and certain place, and you can get a probability of you know how frequently is the particle going to be there. So, so you could square that wave function. And that will, that will change what this looks like. If you square these, then obviously you don't have any more, you don't have any more uh, uh, dips here. In fact, if I say I square n equals 2, then this rises a little bit more, then this inverts and rises a little bit more. And what it says is the particle is more likely to be either here or over here. Okay, For this one, the particle is more likely to be in these three locations, these four locations, these five locations. So this gives us... You know, for the n equals 1, it's more probable to be in the middle. That's the greatest probability. But as you go up here, the particle has this probability exists in different spaces. There are definitely points where there are nodes, where we don't expect the particle to ever be there, actually. So, like, if I square this function at the top up here, there's going to be a peak here, peak here, peak here. But there are places where there are nodes, and a particle is not predicted to ever be at those locations. So, anyway. Um, the next thing is... a. Uh, Example. So I'll bring that up here. So a real straightforward example. Um, we want to find the first two energy levels for an electron that is confined to a one-dimensional box <coughs> that is 0.5 nanometers, or 5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. <clears throat> so, um, we're going to use n squared h squared over 8 ml squared to do this. For the first energy state, n is 1. That just gives us h squared over 8 ml squared. And um, I got those numbers plugged in here. Now, just to be aware... I put in this value up here. This value is the H that's in joule seconds, which you actually you have to put in here because it has to cancel with some units down here. This is meters. This is kilograms. So I have to first put it in the joule seconds form, and then I converted it to EV here. So once you get this number, it's in joules, <clears throat> then you can divide it by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, and we get the 1.5 EV. So, um, yeah, just to be clear, this is first done in joules, then convert to EV. And so for energy two, it's the same thing, but four times greater. So it's the same stuff, four times greater, six EV. If I want to talk about energy three, it's nine times greater. So whatever that is, what, 13.5 or whatever. <clears throat> All right. Whatever it is. Okay. All right. So this is actually what I talked – just before the break, I <clears throat> this is what I was mentioning before – your wave functions are at the upper right here, but the probability distributions, which is the wave function squared, look like these. So, and we normalize these so that, <clears throat> um, like for example, down here, the normalized wave function here means the area underneath this curve is one. That means you will find the particle somewhere in this region. It's more probable to be in the middle but on the edges, it can still exist. For n equals 2 level, <clears throat> the area under the first bump here is exactly a half. Next one's a half. And there are two most likely positions for the particle to be found at. Okay, it looks like what appears to be maybe 1 4 3 fourths L. 
Same thing with n equals 3. It's a one-third, one-third, one-third probability. Okay? And there are places where it's zero. Okay? So while it's one-half here and one-half here, in the middle, <clears throat> you'll, never find, you'll never find the particle there. There's always a destructive interference happening there. It's a node. So anyway. <clears throat> All right, the last problem I'm going to do for this lecture is a square well potential. So this is just like the particle, the box, except the walls are not infinite. Um, the walls have a finite amount of potential energy. And so inside, any energy less than u naught the particle is going to basically behave as if it's inside the box. <coughs> but outside there, it can act like a free particle. So there's actually two regions that we'll need to consider our wave functions at. Before, everything outside of zero and L didn't matter. The walls were infinite. There's no way to cross them. Here, you could have two different states. Well, two different major states, obviously. You could be inside the well. It could be outside the well. Being outside the well means you're a free particle, but you have to have a particular energy to become a free particle. By the way, this is quite similar to the way electrons behave in atoms. <clears throat> there is a square well potential, and this is when they're in their orbital levels, and then when they exceed a certain energy, and they become ionized, and they're a free particle. So the square well potential models very closely how like a basic atom works, for the electrons at least. <coughs> so let's do it. I'm going to bring up some more stuff here to write. Let's bring up the whiteboard. Let's erase all this garbage here. And let's get into this one. Okay, so... Um, Inside the well, your um, energy, right, is less than whatever the potential well is. Um, and therefore, U is zero there. Okay, so your energy is, as long as your energy is less than that, your potential energy is zero inside there. And that exists between zero and L. And so <clears throat> Schrodinger's equation looks like minus h bar squared over 2m second derivative of the wave function with respect to x equals e times your wave function. All right, well, um, this is, these have very well-known um, solutions here. I mean, this is just, you know, it's a second derivative. So this is sines and cosines work just fine here. Um, our wave number, 2me over h bar here. So I'm just because that's what you get when you do the second derivative on the left-hand side. You get a factor of k out of that. I mean, this is something we've already derived, though. I mean, this is the same thing as what we have before. But I'm going to write as k, because when I write out my wave function, it's going to look like this. So uh, a cosine radical 2me <coughs> over uh, h bar x. That's, that's what our k is going to be. Um, and then plus, now we don't have a, an i here because we have a time independent thing going on. So we'll have to write that i. In fact, I don't think we're doing any time-dependent examples, to be honest. I think we're only going to stick with this. <laughs> it's hard enough. So that's our wave function <clears throat> when we are um, 
inside that well. It's just sides of cosines. All right. So no, no big surprise there. Uh, let's look at outside, though. <clears throat> the outside gets a little more interesting. All right, so I'm going to remove this. Clear. Oh, clear. Clear drawing. Yes, okay. So outside the well, um, you have a value for u. It's equal to u naught. So you've you've passed that potential, and this is for x is less than zero, and x is greater <coughs> than l. <coughs> and Schrodinger's equation would look like this. And I'm gonna now you have a a mu naught here, uh, u u naught, not mu. Uh, e. So that's the difference is that now we do have a potential function here because the particle has to at least have have you know reached that point. And our k. <clears throat> <clears throat> In fact, I'm going to label this a little differently. I'm not going to label it K. <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep up my, uh, my notation here, but this is going to be called a kappa, not a K, because it's a little, it's different than the first part. So let me bring this back. I don't know like that. So this is going to be a kappa, so I'm going to try to draw this a little more curvy. All right, so in, now this may look very similar, um, but there's a big difference here. And the big difference here is that E is greater than U naught. So that means your, this kappa squared value is negative, which means K has, it's, it's an imaginary number. And our wave functions have these solutions. Now we don't, this is not, this is kind of a little bit beyond the scope of what we are able to do mathematically in this class. So I'll simply tell you that these are the solutions because this does involve a bit of differential equations to properly solve these. That's a K cap as well. So the solutions here, instead of being um, <clears throat> trig functions, they're going to be exponentials. And you have to still match boundary conditions. <clears throat> and those boundary conditions are the following. <clears throat> that the wave function in the region of zero I'm going to write it kind of funny here. In the region of 0 to L has to match. <clears throat> uh, let me rewrite that, actually. I don't like the way that looks. We just say it like I'll just spell it out, I guess. At x equals 0 and x equals L, um, the wave functions must match. And so what that means is in the inside the well, we had the A and the B, right, on the side of the cosine. Outside, we have the C and the D, which matches the exponentials. When x equals 0, those two functions have to um, match, right? <clears throat> so let's do x equals 0. If I do x equals 0, then I get 
what? I get a that inside at zero equals a, and then at l. Oh no, sorry. At, at for the other one, for this for this is this is inside here. It's a. The one on the outside, if I put in a zero, I get a C plus D. So that means A is C plus D, right? Yeah. And then you got to put in what L is, and good luck with that one, because then you have both your sines and your cosines. Basically, you put it this way, you cannot solve this algebraically. You can't. You can't solve these things algebraically. You can't match the two the sine and cosine with the exponentials. So I wrote as much as we could do here. Right? We could say at x equals zero, the first function is a, the second function is c plus d. So we know that a equals c plus d. Beyond that, um, you have to use something called transcendental functions to solve those. And uh, I mean, I have no idea how to do that. So. So there's really not much we can do beyond this. So we don't have a solution to this because we do not have the mathematical ability to do that. So I'll simply show you what the solutions look like instead of derive them, because we can't. So let's bring up that slide here. <clears throat> so the tricky thing is this. So here are the wave functions here for the first three energy states. You can see in the middle, we have something that looks like a trig function, right? If you look for n equals two, trig function ish, n equals three, trig function is. The tricky thing is making the exponential function and the trig functions match at the boundaries here. And what you see is because the potential well is finite, there is a probability for the particle to exist outside of the well because there's a spread of energy, so to speak. And so as you get to higher and higher energies, there's more likely probability that you can be outside the well, but it's, it's um, still very low. <coughs> <coughs> anyway, so the, the functions outside the well, you can see their exponentials. They drop off asymptotically here inside the trig functions. And, um, the energy states here, now this symbolism down here, the E1 I D W, this is um, the infinite depth well. So these are the energies in the finite well compared to what they are in the infinite well. So the first energy state is lower than it is in an infinite well, okay? The second energy state though, is higher. And then the third energy state is five times larger. And then when you get to the continuum here, you can actually escape this well if you have six times um, the energy level. That's what mu naught ends up, depending on what this, you know, the energies are here. When you get six times that amount, that can escape this well here. So, um, the strange thing about this, though, are these probabilities that you could be outside the well. <clears throat> In fact, here are the probability distributions. When you square these wave functions, these are the functions you get. So for the n equals 1 state, it looks very similar to what we had before. You have a wave function in here with a probability to be in the middle, but there's a little bit of tail on either sides in the wall. Okay, there's a larger amount of tail for n equals 2, and for 3, it's even larger. You see how inside it's still sine function. So fortunately, we aren't, aren't going to do the mathematics for that because it is pretty wild. Um, again, I don't even know how it's done. I've never really studied transcendental functions. So, All right. Oops, 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 oops. One last example. Let's bring that up. Show that uh, the outside the well function satisfies the Schrodinger equation. So you got to take two derivatives of the function up here. That brings out two values of kappa. Okay. 
so we can factor that out. Now there's a negative cap here, but you're squaring that. And so we get back the original wave function with a cap squared. And so we can rewrite it like that, but cap squared is equal to two minus mu naught, uh, two, two M times mu naught minus E over H bar squared. And that's exactly what the other side of the Schrodinger's equation looks like. So this matches up nicely. We get the K squared here, <clears throat> uh, the kappa squared here, and that does match where the other side is.